Everyone can hear me. <laughs> um, it's a great privilege to be the okay. Great privilege to be the first uh, live presentation in well over a year. Uh, my presentation is today is dedicated to Mr. Tim Richards. Uh, he motivated me to do this particular subject with a question that he asked at my last Zoom presentation, and that was he asked me, um, "What was your worst day?" and your best day. And that was a real, uh, that caused me to think, you know, I got the worst day down. Uh, I gave him an answer on the best day and then later on I thought, that wasn't my best day, why did I tell him that? So today, Tim, I'm gonna give you the real answer to your question. <laughs> and uh, the title of my talk is Dancing in Elephant Grass. You'll find out why shortly. Um, one of the things that we did in NCO school was learn navigation. So we uh, were issued compasses and we learned how to read a compass and how to read a map. When I, when I do the uh, Zoom presentations in the class, I like to go through this because I seem to get a good response to the navigation part. And uh, uh, so I, yeah, I teach them a little bit about uh, maps. So I show them this, it looks like a bowl of spaghetti to them, and I ask them, you know, do you know what those lines represent? And usually in a class of 30, 35 kids, there's one or two that know that it's uh, elevation. So uh, as an infantryman in Vietnam, you have to know where you are at all times exactly in order to uh, call in artillery or to come get extracted or to receive your supplies and things. So. Um, uh, this is just an example map here, but if you look at over here, you see a small circle there, right there, and then there's a bunch of circles around it, and that represents a small hill. So everything within that line is at the same elevation or higher, and then everything outside of that line is lower. And uh, you can see the lowest parts are near the uh, streams. And uh, there's, wherever you see the lines bunched up, that's a real hilly area. So when you see something like this, where the lines are almost on top of each other, that's a cliff. So as an infantryman, when you look at this map, you know you can't go there unless you want to go off a cliff. Um, <clears throat> so as an example, here's another map. Uh, up here below that red insignia there, there's a funny shaped circle. So what that is, is it's a U-shaped hilltop. Everything on that U-shaped line is at the same elevation. And if you go out the open end of that U, about two clicks, and you look off to your right, by this red mark, you see a funny looking thing here. There's two little dots here with a line that goes all the way around them. So that represents a Twin Peak Mountain. So. Once you learn to read maps, you can look at this map and actually see in 3D and recognize where you are. Now, this U-shaped hilltop, um, I was on a helicopter coming into that. It was a fire base, and it's a little hard to see on this, but see there, see there? It's a U-shaped hilltop fire base, and if you go out the open end of that and look off to the right, you see a Twin Peak mountain. So in the rest of this presentation, I'm going to use a lot of maps because I'm going to describe some, uh, some operations. Uh, I wrote a book. If anybody's interested in the book, you can see me afterward, and I'll make sure you get a book. Free of charge. I'm not charging for them anymore. I'm just giving them away. Um, this is a map from the book. It's uh, a map of Indochina at the time in 1970. And uh, there's a blue box here, and that's the Central Highlands. And that's inside that box is where my division operated in the Central Highlands. <clears throat> it shows North Vietnam, the, the orange lines are the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, and if I zoom in on that box, it looks like this. So when I first got to Vietnam, I was flown on a C-130 up here to Camp Inari. That was the 4th Division headquarters in 1969. Um, at the beginning of 1970, Camp Inari was turned over to the Arvin, South Vietnamese Army, and the 4th Division moved back here to Camp Radcliffe. 
So for the rest of my tour, I was based out of Camp Radcliffe. Um, now, most of the operations that I'm going to talk about today occurred just north of Camp Radcliffe, up here in the Vintan Valley, right up in there. Um, and it, it spans the month of April. It starts at the end of March and it goes to the end of April. Um, at the end of that, we came back to Campanari, took a convoy across Route 19, took a road up here to New Play Drang and launched an attack into Cambodia. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about Cambodia today because I usually talk about that. Today I'm going to talk about all the stuff that I'm ignoring when I'm talking about Cambodia. So that's what Camp Radcliffe looked in, like in 1970. Uh, Ronnie was there in 65. It didn't look anything like that then. It got built up. But it's, it's a city. You know, electricity, um, you know, some running water, roads. Uh, and there's a bunker line all the way around that thing that's manned 24 hours a day. Um, that's called the golf course, but that's just basically a, an airfield. A lot of helicopters, some fixed-wing aircraft take off from there. Now, if you zoom in on some of these uh, barracks, it, looks like, it looked like this. Hong Kong Mountain, um, but uh, I was in a recon platoon and we were part of Echo Company along with the mortar platoon and whenever we had a stand down and had a couple of days off in the rear, we had one of these little barracks that we went back to and had a couple of days to relax. Um, that barracks is nothing but a concrete slab, wood sides and a, and a tin roof with a single light bulb hanging it. and then there's bunk beds in there with no sheets, but there are mattresses, so. Uh, and we saw that about, we saw that about two days out of every six weeks between missions, so we didn't see it a lot. But it was kind of nice for two days, you got to actually go to a mess hall and get a, you know, hot meal. But that's Camp Radcliffe. Um, now I'm gonna talk about is Operation Eichelberger Black, and that operation of the 4th Infantry, it was not just the 4th Infantry, it was not the 4th Infantry, it was a 3rd Battalion of the 8th Infantry, one battalion of the 4th Infantry. And the, um, the operation lasted about five weeks. It started in, at the end of March. And uh, the, the fire base was right here at a place called LZ Hard Times. <laughs> LZ, yeah, our Hard Times is in Happy Valley. Um, but this right here is a road. So LZ Hard Times is on a road. And um, so we were able to get supplies direct from Camp Radcliffe or anywhere else, and they just run it in trucks right up here to the base. And there was a major uh, artillery battery on hard times, and um, that's where we went first. Normally as a recon platoon, it wasn't unusual for us to go to an area first and do some recon before the, you know, the uh, fire base was set up. In this instance, we weren't the first ones there. We joined after. They had already started constructing the uh, fire base. So that's what it looked like when I arrived there. The engineers had dug holes for bunkers going around the uh, um, fire base. And when that was our hole. We had to arrive there and uh, get in there with picks and shovels and screw out the bottom of that hole. And, uh, and then take a big stack of empty sandbags and take the dirt that came out of the hole, fill the bags. And while we were doing that, the engineers were over cutting down trees to increase the um, fields of fire, and then they would bring a, a load of logs to us. And we could put the logs across the hole, put the sandbags on top of the logs, and create uh, a secure bunker. So that's, that's us sitting on top of our bunker after it was completed. That's me, he's the back side of me. Um, that's me on the right with one of the guys. And there we are having a shaving cream fight on top of, uh, on top of the bunker. We're, we're waiting for orders. We don't know what they're going to ask us to do first. Uh, yeah, and they gave us uh, a day to go swimming in the Song Kong River, um, which was right on, it was right next to the base. And so they had a platoon up in the hills there securing it to make sure the enemy it couldn't come anywhere near. And, we're, and he's blowing up his air mattress there that he usually uses for sleeping. And, we're having a good time. Um, there's Chris doing a little river rafting. So, you know, he did get a little recreation. Uh, so going back to uh, Happy Valley, I did, didn't mention, I added on the last uh, 
map, but this whole area out here outside of the villages is a free fire zone, which means you know the, the, the local population knows that they're not to go out there. If they go out there, it's at their own peril. And uh, we're under the orders that it, when we're out here operating, anybody that's out there is assumed enemy. You can uh, light them up and assume that they're enemy. You don't have to worry. Um, <clears throat> So what villages and hamlets there were tended to be along the river mostly. And um, so I've got these three areas uh, circled. As I go on, I'll uh, go into what happened at each of these three areas. Um, the first thing they had us doing while we were waiting for orders was running sweeps outside of the uh, fire base. And um, they had us, they, they, we did a combat assault from the fire base up to a, tri a tributary to the Song Kong River, which was right up here somewhere. And then we marched all the way back on Easter Sunday. That's a pretty long hike. That Each one of these squares is a click or a thousand meters. So it's one, two, three, it's like 4,000 meters. The longest forced march I ever did in Vietnam. Um, we came down this side. We had to do a river crossing to get on the right side of the river to walk back onto the fire base. And I have this picture of the river crossing. It's a little bit blurry, but it shows what it looked like. Uh, what they're doing here is fumbling around with a fish, an NVA fishing net that was across the stream and we found it and uh, rolled it up and took it back with us so they couldn't catch any more fish. Um, now, some people might wonder, like, how do I remember all this stuff? Well, the truth is I don't. I, I, when, before I wrote the book, I had to do a lot of research and all these events ran together. I, didn't, I remembered events, but I didn't remember when they happened or in what sequence they happened. To write the book, I had to fly to Washington, D.C. and go to the um, National Archives in College Park, Maryland, go up to a desk and request the records for the 3rd Battalion, 8th Infantry for 1969 and 70, and they brought them out on a cart. And I spent a couple days, and I went through, this is uh, called the Daily Journal. So every day we were in radio, when we're out in the field, we're in radio contact with um, the officer of the day, and he's recording our activities, our location, so they always know where we're at in case things start happening and they start sending artillery flying around. They need to know where we are so that we don't receive any of it. So I went through here and I took the information that I was able to find out from that. I put it in a spreadsheet. So I've got a, a page for each month. So this is April. And I just made notes. This is, this is where we were. This is what happened. This was the location. And you can't read it very well here. But that's, it's also notes from my letters that I wrote home. All those letters have a date on them. So I just reread them all. And when I found, oh yeah, I remember that. And I would put a little note on here. And then when you put it all together, um, you can begin to tell a story and then what brings it together really is the 4th Infantry Division issues a quarterly um, operation report and lessons learned. It's a, it's a huge report that um, explains all the operations for the quarter. So I go through there and that's when I found out what was happening around me. When, when I'm out in the, in the bush, I have no idea what anybody else is doing. I have no idea how what I'm doing fits into any operation. I didn't even know the name of the operation was Eichelberger Black. I learned that from the operation report. It didn't matter. I didn't need to know it. Um, but those lessons learned in operation reports really is what allowed me to write a book and tell a story that made some sense and was actually true. <laughs> um, so after we uh, went up and back, um, they put us on what's called a rear reactionary force. You're, you're supposed to be on alert on 15 minutes notice to jump on helicopters and go to somebody's rescue, whoever's in, in, in trouble. So we're hanging out waiting for an emergency call. While we're waiting, my platoon leader asked me to take a fire team and go set up a night ambush over here, right here. And uh, so I did that. We, I had, I think, four or five guys. We went out, set up, stayed awake all night watching a dry creek coming through in case the uh, enemy decided to approach the fire base at night. 
Well, the, the uh, emergency call came while I was out on ambush. So when I got back, everybody was gone. And they went to here, which is a place called Vintan Mountain, or AKA LZ Snipe. And when we got in, they said, okay, hang, on, hang out at the helipad and we'll join you with the rest of your platoon as soon as there's a helicopter available. Um, when there's one available, we went out to snipe. LZ Snipe was a communications relay station for the LERPs, Long Range Recon Patrol, K-75. And um, this is uh, LZ Snipe. It's a very uh, small, long LZ on a it's steep mountain. It's, it's steep on all sides. Um, so here we are, this is our platoon leader, a couple of guys, I think he's got binoculars there. And during the day we were scouring the, uh, the area all around the mountain looking for enemy. And the enemy was, we knew they were in the area because we were listening to the radio communication for the line companies and the LERP teams and they were taught, we were hearing all this activity. Um, so what happened was one of the LERP teams, which wasn't too far from Snipe, now the LERP team there's only four, I think four or five guys in the LERP team, and they go out, they, they put out like five or six teams all in an area, but each team has four or five guys. And they were out and um, they got in contact with the NVA and had a dust up. And one of their tactics is when, uh, number one, LERPs with four guys, you don't stand your ground and and, uh, and, and battle, what you do is you extricate yourself from the situation. So one of their techniques is turn and run. <laughs> but what they do is they always, they always know where their artillery is coming from. And uh, they basically, when they start moving, they call artillery in almost on themselves, you know, pretty close. And when it starts hitting and they, you know, they're confident, they know where it is. They're moving, and then as they move, they just tell the artillery, uh, subtract 50 meters, or 25 meters, subtract 25, subtract. So you can imagine, here's the enemy, here's the lerps running, and there's just a line of artillery following them out, and that's what they did. But they were in such dire straits, they dropped their packs, and they just had their weapons, and their water, and their radios, and they, and they were literally, literally running. And um, they got back, they, somebody picked them up and brought them to snipe. So when I got there, they said, well, we need somebody to go with them back down to retrieve their equipment that they left behind. And so my, you know, me and a, a couple of guys, uh, three or four guys, joined those lerps that had escaped and we went back down, um, set up a little LZ. Me and one other guy secured the LZ and stayed there and the rest of the guys went down and got the packs and came back and then we went up to, uh, back up to snipe. Um, so there's another shot from snipe. Um, our lieutenant then was uh, Lieutenant Virgil Judah, and he was having fun blowing up this mountain over here. There was some activity there, I can't remember what it was, but he was just sitting there with his binoculars and he'd say, well, you see that little spot right there? Let's see if we can take that out in one shot, you know, and he'd look at his, look at his map and, you know, all of a sudden there'd be smoke and explosion and he was just having a good old time. Um, that's a bunker for a uh, mortar platoon that was on LZ Snipe. Uh, you, it's, I don't know how well you can see this on the zoom, but here it's, it's a little bit of light um, problem, so you can't really see it, but there's a bunch of uh, mortar rounds in there. There's a few mortar rounds up here, and there's the uh, aiming pole that they use for uh, orienting the... That's uh, Lieutenant Virgil Judah. And, uh, there's a long uh, just antenna on a PRC-25 radio. Remember what that looks like, because later on that's going to be important. We were up there for a week. So from time to time, almost every day, there was a reason for a helicopter to come in. Uh, we had one that was resupply for us. Uh, we had a chaplain that showed up one day for anybody that wants to get with them and pray. Um, and uh, no, that's... That's no serious. Uh, you know, we had a Catholic chaplain and a Protestant chaplain. Uh, but anyway, when the helicopters came, it you know raised a hell of a dust storm up there. Um, just a little side story. Our, our um, lieutenant's RTO, when he placed the order for the resupply, he almost always would throw in there. We would like a three-gallon pot of ice cream. 
<laughs> it's just a joke, you know. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, on, on Snipe, when they delivered, somebody stole a three-gallon thing of strawberry ice cream, and we got delivered ice cream up here. So we were, we had enough to serve all the LERPs. It was uh, a great ice cream social. Nice. <laughs> so back to Happy Valley again. Here we are at um, LZ Snipe. Um, now, what happened to Lieutenant Judah was, unfortunately, he was a really good lieutenant. We loved him. Um, but when the colonel came out to visit, he made a surprise visit, and he asked Lieutenant Judah, well, how many patrols do you have out, and where are they? And he said, well, sir, I was standing right next to him, so I heard the conversation. He said, well, sir, we don't have any patrols out at the moment. And he said, oh, why not? And he said, well, sir, I didn't see how putting patrols out was going to get anyone home a day sooner. <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> so he, he, uh, he let him get his pack, threw it on his helicopter, he relieved him of his duties, and uh, we were without a platoon leader overnight. Next day we got a new guy, Lieutenant Janice. So um, to get introduced to Lieutenant Janice, they sent us somewhere out here. I didn't even bother to look it up because it doesn't matter, but we took a a flight from the helicopter someplace, and for a couple of days we got to know Lieutenant Janice. Um, so what's coming up next is the subject of this speech, which is dancing in elephant grass, and that is Tim Richards' My Worst Day. So that was at a place, after the two days, we were flown in here to Nuevoc Ka, or otherwise known as Hill 5754. And uh, we were supporting some kind of an operation that the, the um, companies, the line companies, were orchestrating against the 3rd MVA Division. Um, and so this little circle here represents the hilltop. It's 754 meters high, which is about 2,200 feet elevation. And the helicopter, it couldn't land there because there was big boulders up there. But the, the whole area was covered with triple canopy jungle. But it was clear from this area right here. There was no trees whatsoever on that side of the hill. And right here, you can see there's a section where the lines are further apart than anywhere else on that hill. So that tells you that it's the least steep place on that side. So that's where we came in. The helicopter came down. Now that's. The distance between the lines is 10 meters, which is about 30 feet. So it's, it's from here to here, it's dropping 90 feet, so it's not flat. Um, and the helicopter can't set down. It, it was too, you know, too steep. But he could touch his one skid down, and then you could jump out the other side. And we got in. Now, when we went in there, there we thought there was a plan. <laughs> Little did we know the plan was going to change to no plan. Um, but we, we, I wasn't, you know, um, privy to the radio communication with the platoon leader, but we thought we were going to be moving somewhere off this way. And they kept saying, wait, just hold on, uh, we're, you know, something's happening, we're checking with some other company, we're not sure we might change that. And so what we did is, from where we went in, we moved down the hill towards the stream. The famed elephant grass is all right in this area right here down just above the stream definitely below the lz and and we hung out there thinking we're going to be leaving in 15 20 minutes well we hung out for hour it went on for hours and um a squad leader just starting to talk to the platoon leader like you know hey we're sitting ducks here we we're at the bottom of a hill that's got boulders on the top uh, and we're, we're vulnerable as hell for hours. This is not good. And uh, now they, they came back and they said, we've got three of your guys that are in the rear that need to return to your unit. They're back for personal business. Plus our uh, Kit Carson scout, who was a former VC soldier, who was our scout. So we had four guys. And um, so he said, hold on, we're going to send that helicopter out. And we're like, well, you're going to have to bring the helicopter in to the same place we came in four hours ago. And that's not anything you're supposed to do. You know, there's a rule of thumb that says don't use the same LZ twice. And uh, 
He said, okay, we'll find another one. Well, there's no other clearing anywhere else. If for us to find another one, we, had, we would have had to go humping for the rest of the day and looking for a clearing. And finally, they got lazy and said, oh, hell, we'll just bring, the, we'll bring it in. So the helicopter came in, and it came in from here, across this way. And when it got to this area, the NBA was up here in the rocks, and they just opened up on the right side of the helicopter. And that was pretty close. That, that's not that far. Um, the pilot immediately continued, went up and off, and went out and circled and headed back to base. The problem was he, he crashed on the way back to base. Um, miraculously, I would say, everyone on that helicopter, which was eight people, our four guys and four crewmen all survived. So I have to assume, and you correct me, you helicopter guys, but in order for to crash a helicopter and have all eight people survive, you have to have a little bit of control so it's a controlled crash somehow. You know, he was able to minimize the impact. Um, I was in com email communication with one of the guys on there that was shot right through the knee with a AK-47. He was also shot through the hip, and he lost his leg above his knee. And uh, he told me what happened. He said, "Well, I was passed out. I didn't see a serious thing, but when I woke up." The helicopter, the blades were all dug into the ground, the skids were burnt up, and there was sea rations and supplies all over the, str all over the jungle and guys laying around moaning. And uh, they came to their rescue and got them all out of there. Um, only one of them ever returned to our platoon, and that was the, uh, the scout, the, the Vietnamese former VC guy. He, he was back in a few days, and he, he told us kind of what happened. Um, so I took this and I redrew it like this because it's a little easier for me to see. I hope it's easier for you to, but I left out every other line. So here it's um, 60 meters elevation between lines. And here's the elephant grass and the stream. Um, now when the, when the NVA, after the helicopter took off, they just started firing up the elephant grass so well down there. and. We got uh, auto automatic weapons fire coming at us, and there's no protection at all. The, um, the elephant grass is the only thing. They can't see us. They know we're there because those, um, those antennas on the radios that I showed you back there that are so tall, they're sticking up so they can see. You know, we had four radios in the platoon, so they can see that there's... Uh, so they're firing at those antennas. And uh, in firing at the antennas, they got the platoon leader in the stomach. He was very ser severely injured. And uh, one of the guys back in the rear there was hit in the leg real, real serious. And my squad leader was hit in the arm. It was kind of a graze. He, he was back in a few days. Um, so there, there was 25 of us on the ground. The reason I know that is not because I have a wonderful memory. It's because it's in that journal. One night, when the other said, I'm, it's a head count, I mean, yeah, they said 25, so I know there's 25. And there's eight on the helicopter, that's 33 people, and 11 of them got Purple Hearts that day, earned them that day. How tall uh, was the grass? Huh? How tall was the grass? The grass is about seven feet. If you stand up, you can't see, you can, so it's like walking into a mature cornfield. You can't see, any, no matter what you do, you can't see anything further than six, eight feet in front of you. But, so for me, it was the first time, yes? What was it, the VC there? The, the, it was NVA, and they were right here on the hilltop. And the reason, the reason I know that is, long after we got out of there, they had a company sweep through the battlefield, and they found the casings, the shell casings. I learned that in the daily journals like 40 years later. Um, so these boulders, due to some geological uh, phenomenon, they followed this. This is like a little finger that goes down, and it, and the boulders were all along the top, but I didn't see boulders anywhere else. And uh, uh, so anyway, what we did is we called for a um, uh, helicopter gunship immediately. Um, well, before that, let me go into one thing. It's the first time I ever had AK-47 rounds going past my ears, and it was totally frightening. I went in a complete shock because um, my perceptions told me this is the end. You know, it's over. 
this is not survival, but you got no protection. And so I just laid on the ground and I faced towards the fire and I put my uh, rucksack on the ground and I put my helmet on and I just pressed my cheek into the ground and tried to make as small of a target as I could make and, and uh, until the firing stopped. Um, now, there's another problem, and that is we have no idea how many of them there are. You know, uh, for all we know, it's a platoon or a company or something, and, you know, they're all along here. If they wanted to, they could just sweep across and, and they could wipe every one of us out. So that's what's in our mind is, um, you know, I found out fortunately later there was only two or three guys because when you count up the, the number of rounds, we estimated there's about 80 rounds. Well. An AK-47 magazine holds 30, so 80 rounds is three magazines. Uh, so it was either two guys or three guys that shot a magazine each or something like that. It was a, a small group, thank God. Um, now, we called for the uh, helicopter gunships, and they said, well, we don't have any gunships available. They're all out on missions. And before we can get them to you, we've got to send them back and get refueled and rearmed. And we said, well, get them back and get them out here. And, and they did it really quick. I mean, it seemed like it was 20 minutes, which is eternity when you're in this situation. But if you think about ending a mission, refueling, rearming, and getting out in 20 minutes, it's, it's incredible. And when they got there, um, when the helicopter pilots were above, we popped a smoke down here and told the helicopter pilot, you see the smoke? Yeah, I see purple smoke. That's where we are. Please don't light that area up. But, but light up this ridge, especially the hilltop. And they, they, there was two gunships and they just did passing patterns. Actually, they were going this way. And uh, they'd come up here and they'd just fire a, a string of rockets. Wham, 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 right across the peak. And then mini guns, you know, mini guns fire, uh, uh, it's, it's close to 100 rounds a second, and when, when those things fire, it's firing so rapid that you can't hear the individual rounds go off. It's, a, it's just a big moan. Uh, so it's a pretty spectacular uh, thing. It's like a you know, groan like that. And uh, so they just fired that all up. Now the problem we had was, and I got this wrong in my book, but when the, uh, when the guy popped the smoke for the... Uh, for the uh, helicopter pilot, he started the elephant grass on fire. <laughs> um, I thought that the that the uh, rockets from the gunships started the elephant grass on fire, and that's what it says in my book. But one of the RTOs read the book, and he sent me an email. He said, "You got one correction to your book." He said, "I started the fire. <laughs> it was my smoke smoke uh, grenade down here." Okay, doesn't matter. Um, but after you know, going into shock and thinking, having the sensation that clearly my life was over, uh, after the fire, I, I've lost all memory. Like before, uh, before I started working on the book, 40 years later, I couldn't remember anything about what happened. I didn't know where we went, how we got out of there. I had no, no recollection. But <clears throat> some of the guys that didn't have memory loss told me, and then I saw in the journals and stuff that what we did is we escaped the burning elephant grass and left our packs behind because we had to get out of there. We, we thought we were still under fire and we were burning. So um, what we did is we took our weapons, some of our ammo, some of our water, and we retreated into the wood line back here by the stream to get a little bit of protection. And then uh, once the uh, gunships cleaned up and there wasn't any more uh, lead coming our way. What we actually did is we went up to a hilltop up here and spent the night with no supplies, no food, no bedding, no nothing. And then the next morning they came and extracted us and took us back to LZ hard times. So that's the, uh, that's my worst day, Tim Richards. That's the answer to your question. Yeah. So um, this is uh, the elephant grass deal here. We left there, they took us straight back to um, LZ Hard Times, and it took a few days to get sorted out after that. We had to order all new equipment and wait for it to come up on trucks from Monke, and we got resupplied. Um, there was a, a, 
the firing range off the LZ and we went and uh, did target practice and cleaned our weapons and got all ready for our next mission. And then we received our next platoon leader. Platoon leader was uh, Lawrence Johnston. So that was the third one in about two weeks. Uh, we had seven different platoon leaders in the eight months that I was with Recon. And uh, he was a godsend. He was the best of them all. Um, and then I'm going to go to the na another chapter in the book, chapter 8, which is called Romantic Tragedy. You'll understand why when I go through the details of that one. But they said, okay, your next mission's coming up. And our helicopters got on the uh, helipad, and uh, they're warming up. And there we are getting ready. That's uh, the lieutenant's... Uh, RTO looked, checking out his maps and his uh, radio frequencies and things. And we're just waiting for the call to go get on the helicopters. And then this is the trip up to um, our next mission. So, you know, <laughs> down by the river, there's some uh, villages. So, you know, on the first part of the trip, you're going to see some rice paddies and some, some villages and things. Uh, there we are, flying. And then we hit the ground. Now, I took this picture. I was at the tail end of the line, and uh, we landed on a hill, and then we went downhill, and then back up to the top of a taller hill. And we did that to get up there and have a look around to see what are we going to do from here. Um, you can see smoke, and you can see a burnout area. That's because we put artillery on that hill before we arrived. And so that's recon going to the top of the hill. It would have been a lot smarter to just drop us at the top of the hill, but we, weren't all, we didn't always do the smart thing. <clears throat> So this is a zoom in on that area. So where that picture was taken from was over here somewhere. And then, you know, we went downhill and up to the top of a higher hill. And uh, so they gave us orders, okay, we want you to do recon down in this valley. So we took a finger, you, you can kind of see from the elevation lines that there's a finger. We went down, it took us at least two days, maybe three, to get down to the bottom where there's less elevation. And it, this shows a stream. It actually was dry. We never crossed any water. But when we got to this point, we came across what we call a high-speed trail. So it was a heavily used trail, pack, hard packed, and uh, obviously used frequently. Um, the lieutenant had me put my squad up the trail this direction on observation posts to watch. And then he had another squad go this direction to watch the other direction. And then he got on the radio and he was talking to the tactical operation command about, okay, we got a high speed trail here. Which way do you want us to go? What do you think? And uh, as they were having that conversation, an NBA soldier came down the, uh, down the trail and one of, one of my guys uh, popped him. Uh, he, was, he had his AK-47 slung over his shoulder, so he wasn't exactly looking like a point man. You know, he wasn't in the, at the ready. And um, we weren't sure if he was a point man, a lackadaisical point man, or, or, uh, or if he was traveling alone. But um, we knew one thing, we wanted to get the hell out of there because there could be a line of them behind him. So we grabbed his AK-47, we went back up the direction we came, maybe 100 meters, 150 meters made a little um, perimeter, and the lieutenant called back to ta Tactical Operations Command, what do you want us to do? And they said, well, what was he, NVA or VC? And we said, well, it kind of looked like NVA. And they said, well, there was an um, intelligence officer that wanted us to go back down and remove his shirt and bring it back, because they could tell from the manufacturer of the shirt what unit he was from. So the platoon leader, gave me the instruction. By the way, at the elephant grass, I had not been a squad leader yet. Since my squad leader got shot, when he came back, he said, I'm done. I don't want to be a squad leader anymore. And so he said, okay, Millican, you're the squad leader now. So this is my first mission as a squad leader. He says, uh, Millican, take your guys down and get the shirts. <laughs> so, okay. And, and honestly, in my book, I tried to write about feelings and stuff, but, you know, if I'm thinking about this, at that time I would have gone, oh, are you sure, Lieutenant, that you want me to do You know, it's like, oh, that sounds a little dangerous. You know, there could be a bunch of them down there now. Um, but psychologically, what I have to do is suck it up and go, oh, yeah, no problem. It shouldn't be any big deal. Yes, sir. 
And uh, we left our packs behind, and we took our weapons, and we took part of our ammunition. We took water, and we took one radio, and we went back to that location. When we got there, he was still laying in the same position and the same posture we left. So I knew that either he had traveled alone, or if he had buddies, they had fled and deserted his body. But it, uh, I put the observation post both ways up the trail, went up and took his shirt off and, uh, and collected his pack and uh, other stuff to return back to the lieutenant. Um, the guy was very young, I would say definitely a teenager. And when we got back up to the unit, we dumped his pack out and went through it, and it wasn't much in there. You know, there was, he didn't have a lot of ammo. He did have, the most, mostly he had rice. He had a map, which was good, and he had a little one by one inch photo of either his girlfriend or his wife, which kind of, it struck me, you know, it was really tough because I always looked at the enemy as at least evil and hopefully inhuman, you know, that way, uh, when you're trying to kill them, you, you can feel a little bit better about the act. Um, but when you see something like that, irrefutably, you know that he's the same as, as I am. He's no different. And so that was a huge struggle. Um, you know, uh, it, it kind of wiped me out a little bit. But, you know, you keep moving. You know, you, don't, you can't sit there and cry. Um, and uh, we went back up the hill to where we came from. And the tactical operation command said, well, we want you to move to the east, and then we want you to drop down and look for the same trail at a different location. So we went down this finger here. So as we're going down, it's downhill in front, pretty steep, and it's downhill on both sides. It's a finger. And uh, it's dense, triple canopy jungle. When we got partway down, I'm going to guess it's here because the lines are a little bit far apart. Uh, there was a partial opening where a helicopter could get partway. You could get a partial uh, delivery. <clears throat> so we, we were running low on food and lots of things. And so we called for a resupply. And the helicopter came in. He had to do a, a kick out, which is from about 20 feet, hovering about 20 feet up, he pushed all the supplies out. And we resupply. Now the problem is now everybody in the area knows exactly where we're at. And uh, so we quickly packed up the sea rations and the other stuff um, and continued down the hill. Uh, when we got down here, we retired and we set up a little uh, perimeter, a little temporary thing just to take a break. And we were at the trail. We could see the trail. And as we're sitting there taking a break, we hear voices of somebody coming down the trail from this side, and the language is Vietnamese, so somebody's coming down the trail. Well, the guys in the front were very nervous because they were literally 10 feet from the trail, and they felt vulnerable, like they, they didn't think they could hide themselves. Um, and after there was a little hill, and the, uh, the enemy came over the hill, and they stopped, and they were looking around like, uh, you know, uh, what's it? Pause, big pause, and then they backed across the hill, and we're all like, "Oh shit, they've seen us." They they, they either heard our safety's getting clicked off, or they saw something, or heard a noise, or something. And so now they're behind the hill, and they know we're here. Get ready for uh, a shootout. Well, they decided the coast was clear, and they came back across. And those guys in the front uh, took out the first two, and the rest of them escaped across the hill. Um, so we collected another couple of eight, or one AK-47. Uh, this turned out to be a squad of Viet Cong. Uh, their garb was completely different. It was like civilian, uh, black pajamas and all that stuff. <clears throat> and um, about two minutes later down here, we could hear, first of all, the guys in front said two of them were women. And there was about five men. And we heard a loud wailing sound of a female. Um, who I can only assume was distraught over the loss of her comrade, boyfriend, husband, whoever got taken out. But she couldn't contain herself, and so you had all this loud wailing, and uh, Lieutenant Johnson put, immediately put artillery down there. You know, um, I don't feel too good about that either. You know, you got a, a woman on the run, she's distraught, she's lost somebody important, and you're 
trying to kill her. What, what am I doing here? Um, anyway, we, we scooped up his AK-47. His AK-47, I couldn't even believe it was still in service. It was rusty, it was old, um, uh, beat up thing, and we went back up the hill. When we got back up to where our helicopter resupply was, somebody had gone through the trash. It wasn't the way we left it. So we had been followed coming down the finger. Um, anyway, we went back up, spent a couple more days, and they decided, okay, you're, you're out of here. So they said, find a, a landing zone for extraction. Uh, we went off this way, and, and we, got, um, we got extracted over here somewhere. So that, this whole operation was about seven days. And so it's, you know why it's romantic tragedy. Um, this is a picture on the top of the hill. It was actually before we went down, but you know, we had some artillery coming in. It's burning. It's a little hard to see, but this is like a Y-shaped valley here. And uh, those spots where the uh, contact occurred were somewhere down here. Um, that's my squad up on the top of the tall hill. Um, um, Bob Ortega is the one that took out the NVA soldier, and uh, Joe Doli. Uh, Joe's coming to New Newport, uh, I hope, in a few weeks, where I'm going to see him for the first time in the 51 years. Um, now, he was in my platoon, and, and I, now that I got him, I found him on Facebook, and he's living in Hong Kong. And so I had a little bit of email with him, and I didn't even know it after living with him, but he was. Um, an immigrant to the United States. He was born in Hungary. His English was so perfect, you wouldn't have ever guessed it. Uh, he was on his second tour, which I also didn't know because he never told me and I never asked. Um, and he says he speaks 12 languages fluently. I call him the international man of mystery, <clears throat> the most interesting man in the world. Uh, but anyway, I'll see him shortly. Um, Another book? No, no. <laughs> There'll be no more books. <laughs> Um, so this was just a shot I took on the way down the hill to one of those uh, contact sites and this is when our, my squad was the, on the point. This was the point man and I was in the second position. But you can see how dense, <coughs> dense it is. It's, uh, it's um, you know, everything is scary. It's because, you know, the, the enemy could be right there and he can hear you coming because you got to whack through the vines with your machete and you can hear that further than you can see. And so. Um, and that was the uh, AK-47 we got off the first guy, the NVA. It was in pristine condition. And that's me holding the VC AK-47, which is rusted out. Can't believe they didn't issue him a new weapon. <laughs> that was definitely a ragtag squad there. So when we left, um, this was the LZ we found. It's pretty amazing to find such a clearing in Triple Canopy Jungle. I don't know why. You know, God creates openings in, in triple canopy, but, you know, why doesn't a tree grow there? I don't know. Um, but there's 30 of us around this thing. Um, there's several in that picture, but you can't see them because they're recon. But I took my camera and I swung it to the right, and uh, that's where we popped the smoke for the helicopters coming in to extract us. And then when they came in, I panned the camera further to the right, and there's the first helicopter coming down. That was my former squad leader, Jim May, I believe it looks like him. So the first group got on and then you, there's one up here and there's one here and they're just coming in one at a time picking up uh, six, six infantrymen at a time. Uh, there's Joe Dolai, the most interesting man in the world. Uh, Dennis Edwards, one, two of my guys. And then on the way back we're going by an old bombed out hill. Now we're into the population, so we must be getting close to the fire base. Now we're on the helipad at the fire base, and we're all exhausted. And we look back at the last helicopter coming in. And then this is uh, just a couple minutes later, but our lieutenant, Lawrence Johnston, he was called to the command post as soon as we got in. He went there, and they said, great job, and they gave him his second lieutenant bars. So what he's doing there is he's pinning on his second lieutenant bars. He just got a promotion. Um, I found Lieutenant Johnston about two months ago. I knew he was from the Baltimore area, and uh, 
I, when I was watching Ronnie Geyer's Vietnam uh, uh, documentary, they had a thing on before that I taped, but I didn't watch it for a while. And then one day, I'll watch that thing. I watch it, and they had a segment with him talking about um, what, what it's like to walk point. Only here, he's 21 years old, and now he's 70 years old. Well, that thing was done. He was 60-something. Um, and I thought, oh, Larry, he, he, Larry lives. And, and the, the video was made in Baltimore by AMVETS, and so I knew he's got to be in Baltimore. So I started doing a search, and I found him. And I found several Lawrence Johnstons. Firstly, it had a T, Johnston, and it was Lawrence, L-A-W, not L-A-U. So it cut it down to a few. And I said, I think this must be him. And I sent him a letter, and I sent a, this picture and another picture. And I said, Larry, if that's you, give me a call or send me an email or something, and I got an email, and we... He hasn't talked to anybody since he left Vietnam, anybody that he knew in Vietnam. And he's one of those guys like me at one point that put it all, you know, forgot about it, and, uh, you know, his wife didn't know what he did, and, his, and uh, his kid didn't know what he did, and I sent him a book, and he sent me things. His wife read the book, and she, oh, now she knows what he, what he did. That was... That was kind of neat, you know, to, uh, it was something that he was unable to articulate, but, you know, uh, I had a few other deals like that. I had uh, one guy, it was the guy in the beginning that had his hand on my head and had all the bandages, Larry. He died um, recently, and um, his daughter got a hold of me somehow, and I sent her a book, and she sent me an email, and she said, right now, I'm going to cry. Excuse me. She said, right now I'm sitting in front of Daddy's grave. I'm reading your book. And she said, I'm, I'm so thankful because he, he never talked about it. I had no idea what he did. And I had a couple of pictures of him in the book. Um, but, you know, those are some of, the, some of the benefits of going to the trouble of writing a book. So, um, after uh, all that, um, it was time to go to Cambodia. <clears throat> what happened was, um, we had we were just starting the next mission, and all of a sudden everything went in lockup. It's like uh, um, they're just saying stay put, and it's like a day goes by and nobody says anything, <clears throat> and we're like something's up, and the news feeds are talking about Cambodia invasion, and so on April 30th, Richard Nixon goes on TV in America and announces to the American people that American troops and Arvin troops are going to commence a, uh, an incursion into Cambodia. Um, that sparked the Kent State Massacre, which occurred four days later. It took the students four days to organize, and that's how long it took the 4th Division to organize. Um, we got on trucks here at um, Camp Well, first of all, we went from LZ Hard Times to Camp Inari, and then we were there for several days getting prepared. We had a we uh, picked up a M60 machine gun, which recon platoons don't normally carry, but we're f figuring we're going to be fighting, so we need it. Um, they had us remove all our ammunition from our magazines, and we're carrying uh, 28 magazines per person. You put, take it all out, uh, put it in a box, they shipped it to the Arvins to use, and then we put all fresh ammo in there. They didn't want any used ammo that might not function properly. So we took three days to get ready. We got on trucks and we did a convoy down Route 19. And then here somewhere there's an intersection and we took a road and then it turned into a dirt road and took us to this place called New Play Durang. That's where we staged for an incursion into Cambodia. It was, that was our battalion, which is 500 infantrymen. Another battalion, which is 500. So there's a thousand men. That area, there's no trees, it's a plain. And so you, here you are in the middle of uh, uh, an empty plane, and there's a thousand guys standing around. It was kind of weird. Um, but they picked this particular area because there was a little airstrip there. It was a former Special Forces camp that had been abandoned, so it had a, a runway. And it was accessible by road, so they could run. Um, the main thing was they had to run fuel tankers up to there and then take the fuel and pump it into bladders on the ground. And the reason was, when you start in going into NVA base area 702, uh, you got a half an hour flight to get there. You drop your guys, and 
it, you know, it's too far to go to where the fuel depot is because it burns too much fuel. You know, you don't have any time when you get there. So they, they would come back to uh, New Plagering, refuel the helicopters from the bladders, and then make another run. So we had 120 helicopters at our disposal. And just me doing the math, between all these battalions, there was two here, there was one here at Jackson Hole, there was one at Oasis, and there was one at Meredith. That, that, that adds up to 3,000 infantrymen. If you get six at a time on the helicopter, it's almost 500 sorties. It's the largest helicopter combat assault of the Vietnam War. And um, so anyway, that's, that's it for another presentation another day. But what I talked about today was a five-week period before, before it got serious. Now, when I, when I give these presentations, I usually talk about Cambodia, because it's the big one, but I, I ignore all this other stuff. So this is the first time I've really gone into detail on you know, the smaller operations. Oh. And now we've got my best day, and that was here at the 67th Evacuation Hospital in August of 70. Um, and I was, in, I was in this thing right here, and I had a compound case of mononucleosis and hepatitis. I had eaten dinner with an Ivan soldier. He cooked some stew in his uh, steel pot helmet, put a bunch of peppers and stuff that he stole out of some farmer's field, and he threw a sparrow in there, which was my downfall. And when I woke up the next morning, I had a temperature of 103, and they flew me here, and then I had a temperature of 105, and uh, the nurse had me standing in a cold shower because I was going to fry my brain here. They actually told me I had malaria, and it, it took a whole week before they changed that and said, you don't have malaria. You have mononucleosis and hepatitis. Either one of those could take three to six months to get over. The two together, we have no idea because none of the doctors that I can find in here have ever treated anybody with both of those. But he said, when are you scheduled to go home, Sergeant? And I said, uh, about five, six weeks, I got an early out to go back to college. He said, okay, I'm signing your papers. You're going to Japan for a week of evaluation, then you're going back to Fort Ord. That was the best moment. <laughs> because, because right there, you know, a couple days earlier, I was still in the fear mode and the psychological dealing with the fear mode, and all of a sudden, I could just leave all that behind and just go home. <laughs> So there you go. Yes, questions? On, on your picture uh, of the road that you guys took to go to Cambodia, there's a pass on 19 called My Something. Area. Yeah, I've been through it a few times. What's it called? Um, um, Bang Yang Pass. Bang Yang, Bang Yang, yeah. And Bang Yang, it's a famous pass because the, it, it's uphill on both sides. And um, back long before I was there, the French were defeated there by the Viet Minh, and as Ronnie knows, the French soldiers are still buried there. On top of the hill, there's a bunch of crosses, and they buried the Frenchmen standing up facing France. And uh, the, now, whenever we pass through there, because of the vulnerability of being having two hilltops on either side of you in close proximity, we always had helicopter gunships uh, patrolling up and down. So if anybody did take a pot shot at us, they were, they were going to have to deal with some serious ordinance. Yes? On your map of Cambodia, did it show where that Paris B place was that we used to talk about? Yeah. Um, I'd have to go all the way back to the beginning, but I can do that while I'm talking. Yeah, it, it's, um, wait a minute, yeah. Are you doing it? Are all of these your pictures, or did you get them from others? Almost all these are mine. Like this one, I got from one of my platoon mates. Um, the one of the hospital I got online from somebody that was there. I'd say 90% of these are mine. Did the archives have pictures at all? No, I didn't get any pictures from the uh, National Archives. Okay. Um, well, uh, what I did is I had an ammo pouch that I kept right here, 
And in it was my camera in a plastic bag, so if I wanted to take a picture, I could just reach back and pull the camera out. And, and, and um, um, I didn't take, I really didn't take a lot of pictures. Yes, sir? Yeah, I'm just curious. You said you had about like seven or eight uh, platoon yeah. members. Why did you have so many? Were they just keep shoveling people in? Well, no, there was, there, there was always a reason. The one that was there when I got there was a West Point guy, and he just timed out while, at, shortly after I got there. So the next one got relieved of his duties because when the colonel made a, a, an emergency visit, which they do, you know, they don't announce they're coming all of a sudden, and, it, and, he, and we were relaxing with our boots off. And that's against regulation. They relieved him of his duties, so we had that. Um, and then we had the three I mentioned, you know, it's just, just, just circumstances. circumstances, you know, the only one that was really wounded was Janice that I talked about in the elephant grass. The others were malfeasance and different things. Yes, sir. What did, what did the, uh, the lieutenant say to the commanding officer that got him on the Well, when the commanding officer asked him, how many patrols do you have out and where are they? He said, well, sir, I have none at the moment. And he said, why? And his answer was, well, sir, I didn't see how putting a patrol out was going to get a single man home any earlier. Yeah, so we loved him because he was honest to... <laughs> but but if, you, if, you want, if, you're a, if you're an officer and you want longevity and you want promotion, you are not honest. Right? <laughs> you bullshit them because they don't want to know the truth. They want to know if you know the politically correct answer. And, and he wasn't willing to give the politically correct answer. So that's why we were. When you got, uh, when you got promoted to squad leader, how big an outfit did you have? I had uh, seven, seven or eight guys. That squad is seven or eight. So the whole platoon is about 28. Mm -hmm. uh, it's three squads and a headquarters squad. So seven or eight guys. How long did you, did you finish? Yeah. You stay there? Yeah, until the, until I went home. They kind of did it that way, and is you know you were once once a squad leader, you remained a squad leader until until you went home or got wounded or something, and then whoever was senior went in there. You said you were an eighth infantry division. It was the fourth. Fourth. Oh, you were fourth. It was the third battalion of the eighth infantry regiment which is part of the 4th Infantry Division. And then the other one, as you said, you went to NCO school? Yes. Was that while in country? Or no, it was right after advanced individual training. So I got trained as an infantryman. And I never heard of it. I didn't volunteer for it. I got drafted into it. Um, but I, my orders just came down. Everybody, all, everybody else in my infantry class was uh, deployed to Vietnam, and me and a handful of others got these orders to go to Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, it's an interesting deal. At that time, the Army didn't have enough trained squad leaders, and the reason was the Army was loaded with two-year guys. And if you went to Vietnam after you were trained as an infantryman, and they liked to have a squad leader be a sergeant if possible, but it wasn't possible because if you waited until they got promoted to sergeant, they'd be at the end of their one-year term. So what they started doing was picking some guys and sending them to NCO school. So we went in, we came out tw as, a, as a private E3, private first class, come out 12 weeks later as a sergeant E5, and then you go to Vietnam qualified to be a squad leader. They didn't want to put you in as a squad leader immediately. They wanted to have a few too many so you could get oriented and then when it was your turn you could just step into it. Do you want to share what they call that program? Shake and bake? Shake. Or, um, <laughs> it's, or, no, it's interesting. We were the most hated because everybody hated us. The privates that went over hated us because we, got, we came in at a, a rank they hadn't reached yet. The uh, senior guys, like our platoon sergeant, really hated us because he was in E7, and it took him six or seven years to make E5, and then you know to, to E7. So we come in as an E5, and we're wet behind the ears. So he's he's not happy with us. So nobody liked us. But the, the army did a report, which I found. I 
downloaded it off the internet, and it was a summary of the uh, NCO Shake and Bake program, and they called it Shake and Bake in the official document because it became such a term. But um, uh, they claimed it was a huge success, and because of the success of it, they continued it. They changed it a little bit. It, it became not just to train uh, squad leaders for Vietnam, but it became to train uh, people as non-commissioned officers. It, it became kind of like OCS light. Yeah, and you know what? It's still around. It worked just fine. It worked good, yeah. It worked just fine. The people that came out of there yeah. were quality people. Yeah. They were good leaders. And that program was, um, <clears throat> it, it, I can't even tell you how to well, I can't speak for myself, but the other two squad leaders, it def def definitely top-notch guys. Uh, and uh, here's the thing, the platoon leader is not stupid. If you put somebody in there that's a dud, you know, that, that isn't competent or uh, whatever, he'll just pull them out like that. It, you, don't get to, you don't get to stay there if you're not performing. Yes, sir? You know, I find interesting is uh, I was in the MPs. And uh, I share that feeling of shake and bake, nobody liked you. Mm -hmm. direction. But um, we were so poorly trained compared to some of your infantry units, and yet we were expected to do what you guys were doing oftentimes. And uh, I, I just find it, uh, it incredible that the Army, the, the failures were so broad. Mm -hmm. Just so broad. Uh, you you seem to get your equipment. We couldn't get equipment. You seem to get you know changes. We couldn't get changes on anything. Well, I'd have to say that's one of my biggest um, you know accolades for the United States Army is uh, whatever we needed. If we ordered it on the radio, I, I can't even remember being refused anything. Uh, unlimited. Yes, sir. Uh, before you went to the Oculus Center, did you know that the 4th Division records were there? Yes. I had talked to, uh, it, it's a long story, I probably won't take all the time together, but there was a guy that wrote a book about our Cambodian incursion, and, um, and I read his book. That's where I kind of got motivated to write my own book, cause, and uh, he, that's where he got his information. And he was with the 101st Airborne, and he had been a public information officer for them, so he knew how to access information. And he told me, oh, it's there. That's where you got to go. So I went there, and it was there. Because archives are stored in several locations across the country. So yeah. how could I find out where my uh, unit's histories are? Um, you, I, you'd have to somehow contact the um, uh, National Archives. and Because I know stuff is definitely divvied up, but he told me the the uh, daily journals for the units in Vietnam are at College Park, and he was correct. And I don't know what wasn't there. Did you look at the morning reports also? Yeah, there was two kinds of reports. Journal, there was two types of journal deals. One was done by our battalion, and the other was a S123, whatever, some other level of, uh, of report. Yes, and I saw, I got almost nothing out of that, but I went through them. Ours was the one. Ours was the one that had the details that I needed to know. Yes. I do not. Nope. I have two daughters, and neither one of them is in the military. Yes. They, they taught you navigation in that NCO school? What about second lieutenants? They don't teach them? <laughs> oh, yeah. They get, they get the very same course with the very same instructor. They do, because when we went there, they gave us a sales pitch, you know, before we even started training. You can switch to OCS. Uh, you know, they gave us a big, long um, sales presentation. At the end, they said, anybody that says you go to the desks at the back of the room and sign up. But you had to extend your enlistment by a year from two to three. So, and there was, um, uh, our whole company was in there, training company, which would have been around 200 guys. And at the end, they said, okay, everybody that's interested to go to the back, everybody got up and went out the front door. Not one guy. I'm just, 
But they took. Well, the second lieutenants I knew, they just didn't know how to read a map at all. Oh, I, the ones I knew definitely did. But I should, yeah, I don't know why the ones you. But um, when when they were giving us the presentation, they said that the course, some most of the courses that NCO takes are the same courses that OCS takes. It's just OCS takes a whole lot of other stuff that we don't get exposed to. So and so. Um, NCO school was about navigation, tactics, and um, um, you know stuff that you don't get in AIT. Leadership training and you know st stuff. When, when yep. you did your comp uh, did you have an MPS court or a trans command uh, truck escort with uh, gun trucks? When I went where? When you did your Cambodian excursion. Uh, we went by helicopter into Cambodia. It was a, a, a big giant convoy and it had helicopter escort. So they, there was different um, landing zones along that long route which is about 100 miles long and so one group of helicopters would escort you to you know LZ Blackhawk and then they'd land and a fresh group would join. So you always had two gunships flying overhead. The reason why I ask is uh, I was in the 504th Infantry Battalion, Company B. Company B was in Hontay and played coup with two different platoons. My platoon was in Dene. So we were stretched all over the place. They had gun jeeps with armor, mostly shooting 60s, and B-100 armored cars with twin machine guns and they had a little uh, 40 millimeter you know, uh, grenade, grenade launcher M79 gun yeah. and stuff like that when they came to Dene and they did the pass I was asking about came to Dene and we went from Chulai to Fubai on 201 uh, fortunately, I didn't do as many combos as some of my brothers did, but uh, we had open jeeps, M60s, or uh, we had uh, three-quarter ton trucks with M60s, and they would load those down, of course, with an extra guy and extra ammo and stuff. We didn't have V100s, we didn't have tracks, we, we had nothing, and that was my reference to why we didn't get stuff that the units did. Our sister company at Fubai, A Company, had the hunters. But they went from Fubai to way and up you know, uh, on Congress. So to answer an earlier question, this is the uh, Parrot's Beak right down here by Saigon. And, uh, and the uh, fish hook is right up here. So they're south of our area of operation. Uh, okay. yeah. I want to thank you very much for bringing me back to when I went there in 65. Uh, the very first air assault of the uh, first air cab was to go into San Paul Valley, Happy Valley, and uh, it was just east of our Anke. Uh, and I remember driving the, uh, the Colonel's Jeep up the one the road up towards the middle of the valley before the helicopters got in there. And uh, our executive officer was in front of me, walking each side of the road, going up there looking for, for mines. And uh, when we got up to where there was a, a village hut, we turned off to the side and parked, and we were fine, okay? And then about two minutes later, we hear a boom, <laughs> like that, and a three-quarter ton truck, just where I'd been driving, uh, got caught, got caught, got caught in the truck. Ran over a mine, huh? That was in October of 1965, and we four years later were we're right there, the whole thing. I want to thank you for sharing everything. You're welcome, Anna. Pardon?